SpaceX successfully launched 40 spacecraft to orbit under its Transporter 4 mission on April 1. Transporter 4, SpaceX's fourth dedicated small sat rideshare program mission, lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station at 12.24 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Friday. Transporter 4 was SpaceX's 12th overall flight and second transporter mission of the year. Because of the rocket's southerly trajectory, the booster landed on a drone ship in the Caribbean near the Bahamas, about 530 kilometers downrange from Cape Canaveral. The booster achieved its seventh flight to space since its first mission with NASA's Crew-1 astronauts in November 2020. Initially, the upper stage deployed the mission's largest payload, Germany's NMAP Environmental Monitoring spacecraft, and two smaller payloads into a sun-synchronous orbit at 650 km. Two more second-stage burns followed this to lower the rocket's orbit to around 500 km to separate the remaining satellites. The NMAP spacecraft, weighing 980 kg, carries a hyperspectral Earth imaging instrument that surveys crops, forests, and other surfaces, providing detailed information about the state of vegetation and plant health. SpaceX has completed its 150th successful mission with the successful deployment of all 40 satellites on Friday. SpaceX will now be gearing up for Axiom Space's AX-1 mission to the International Space Station, which will launch on April 6. The AX-1 mission will be followed by the classified NROL-85 mission on April 15. On April 20, SpaceX will launch four astronauts to the ISS aboard the brand new Crew Dragon Freedom. The fifth mission planned for this month is the Starlink Group 414 mission, which is scheduled to launch on April 30. As per recent reports, SpaceX plans to end the production of Crew Dragon capsules, as the space transportation company heaps resources on its Starship program. Since its first crewed flight in 2020, Crew Dragon has flown five crewed missions to space, including the first ever all-civilian mission last year. After each flight, the capsules undergo refurbishment at SpaceX facilities in Florida, which the company calls Dragonland. Because the crew capsule production has now ceased, SpaceX will reuse the refurbished Crew Dragons for future missions in the same way that it reuses Falcon boosters. Currently, the company has four Crew Dragon capsules, Endurance, Resilience, Endeavor, and Freedom. SpaceX aims to use each spacecraft at least five times for crewed missions. According to SpaceX President Gwynne Shotwell, SpaceX will continue to produce components for the spacecraft, and it will retain its capacity to manufacture additional Crew Dragon capsules, if a need arises in the future. On April 3, due to a problem with the mobile launcher, NASA canceled the first attempt to fuel its Space Launch System rocket with more than 3,300 cubic meters of super-cold propellant and conduct a practice countdown. With the arrival of the SLS rocket at Pad 39B on March 18, NASA engineers and technicians have been busy for the past two weeks making final preparations for the vehicle's critical design verification test, also known as the wet dress rehearsal. The test will see the mission team fuel up SLS on the launch pad and then go through a practice countdown that will stop at T-minus 10 seconds, just before the core stage's four RS-25 engines would ignite during an actual launch. NASA's three-day practice launch countdown and fueling test for its Artemis 1 moon rocket started on Friday, April 1. However, NASA announced on April 3, shortly before 12 p.m. EDT, that it was scrubbing its wet dress rehearsal for the SLS before crews began loading any propellant into the vehicle. According to the agency, fans in the mobile launch platform, which are required to create positive pressure in enclosed areas of the platform to avoid the buildup of hazardous gases, were not working as expected. Even before the fan problem, NASA was running behind schedule with the test. Severe thunderstorms including several lightning strikes on April 2 delayed the wet dress rehearsal activities at Launch Complex 39B. Four lightning strikes occurred in the vicinity of the Pad 39B on Saturday, including the strongest strike to the pad's protective catenary wire and tower structure designed to shield the rocket from direct lightning hits. With Sunday's scrubbed attempt, NASA's next opportunity to test fueling operations could occur as early as Monday, April 4. The webcast of the wet dress rehearsal is available via the link provided in the description. Blue Origin successfully carried out its fourth crewed space flight on Thursday, carrying six people on a brief trip to space and back. The new Shepard suborbital rocket blasted off from the company's launch site 1 in West Texas on March 31. This 20th New Shepard mission, dubbed NS-20, was the fourth crewed Blue Origin flight and the first without a celebrity passenger. The crew members included Blue Origin engineer Gary Lai and five paying customers, Sharon Hagel, Mark Hagel, Marty Allen, Jim Kitchen, and Dr. George Neald.
Please see the link in the description to learn more about these incredible people. About two and a half minutes after liftoff, the crew capsule separated from the 18-meter tall rocket and soared to an altitude of 106 kilometers. The crew members experienced a few minutes of weightlessness near the end of their brief ride before the capsule re-entered the atmosphere, descended to the desert floor under a canopy of three parachutes, and landed safely outside the West Texas town of Van Horn. The mission was historic not only because it was the first New Shepard mission without a celebrity passenger, but also because it launched the first married couple in a commercial spacecraft. Blue Origin already holds Guinness World Records for the youngest, oldest, and a pair of siblings launched into space. Thursday's flight was New Shepard's first since a flight on December 11. Last year, Blue Origin flew 14 people on three crewed flights, and it expects to at least triple the number of people flown to space this year. That translates to at least 42 people, or seven flights of six people each. A U.S. astronaut and two Russian cosmonauts have landed in Kazakhstan after leaving the International Space Station aboard the same capsule despite heightened U.S.-Russian antagonism over the war in Ukraine. The Russian Soyuz capsule carrying NASA's Mark Bandhai and his cosmonaut peers Anton Shkaplerov and Pyotr Dubrov undocked from the International Space Station at 6.45 a.m. GMT on March 30. After a 4 hours 43 minutes long journey, the astronauts made a safe parachute-assisted landing in Kazakhstan at 11.28 a.m. GMT. The wind in the area caused the Soyuz to tip over on its side after landing, all three crew members were extracted from the vehicle safely. Van Hai, who at 55, completed a 355-day mission on the space station, the longest single stretch of time any American has ever spent in space. NASA's Scott Kelly held the previous record, having spent 340 days aboard the orbiting lab from March 2015 to March 2016. 40-year-old Dubrov, who launched to the ISS with Van High last April also returned home after 355 days in space, but this is not a Russian record. Cosmonaut Valery Polyakov, who holds the record for the longest single stay in space, spent 437 days off Earth on the Russian space station Mir from January 1994 to March 1995. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. During the early morning hours of March 31, Booster 7, the first super-heavy prototype to be launched from Starbase for an orbital test flight, left the High Bay building and began its journey to the Starbase launch site. After a two-hour-long journey by road, the booster arrived at the launch site to begin its ground tests. Two days later, a SpaceX crane lifted the booster and placed it on top of the orbital launch mount. Based on road closures, SpaceX will begin testing Booster 7 as early as Monday, April 4. The tests will begin with a series of cryo-proof tests, in which the booster will be filled with liquid nitrogen to ensure that this upgraded booster prototype can withstand extremely low temperatures and high pressures. About two weeks ago, SpaceX delivered a booster test stand, also known as the Can Crusher, to the launch site. Made up of large steel structures, this structural test stand is outfitted with 33 hydraulic rams to simulate the force of 33 Raptor engines that the booster will experience during an actual flight. After the cryo-proof test campaign, SpaceX might remove the booster from the launch mount to begin structural testing. It should be noted that, unlike Booster 4, which was outfitted with grid fins prior to rollout to the launch site, SpaceX has yet to install grid fins on Booster 7. Therefore, in the absence of grid fins, SpaceX could easily install the test stand's cap on top of Booster 7 once it arrives at the launch site, potentially allowing the engineers to simulate both the thrust of all 33 engines, as well as the stress caused by acceleration during flight. Upon successfully completing the cryo-proof and structural tests, SpaceX will outfit Booster 7 with Raptor version 2 engines and reinstall the booster on the launch mount for static fire testing. Three of the 39 Raptor version 2 engines that will be installed on Booster 7 and Starship 24 arrived at the Starbase factory last week. Altogether, 36 C-level engines and three vacuum Raptor variants are required to fully outfit Booster 7 and Ship 24 before the orbital test flight. According to Elon Musk, all those engines will be ready only by this month, and then it will take a month to integrate them onto the booster and ship. He is optimistic that the orbital flight test will take place in May. But I think a May launch is highly unlikely, and we may have to wait until June to witness the historic test flight. However, an orbital test flight from Boca Chica is contingent on the FAA launch license, which is subject to the Environmental Assessment Report of the Starbase launch site. 
If the FAA does not grant SpaceX a license to launch a Starship from South Texas, the next option is an East Coast launch from Florida's Launch Complex 39A. According to Musk, the Florida launch pad will have a better launch tower and improved ground systems compared to the facilities at Starbase. Piling works for the Starship's second launch tower and launch pad are currently underway at Launch Complex 39A. In addition, launch tower sections are being built at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility. The Florida Starship launch facility will be operational by the end of this year. The rollout of Booster 7 to the launch site freed up space inside the high bay for SpaceX to begin stacking Booster 8. The methane tank section of Booster 8 has already been fully stacked, and the oxygen tank sections, including the aft dome, are being prepared for stacking. Booster 8 could be fully assembled by the end of this month. White Bay construction is progressing, and workers have begun installing the 150-ton bridge crane into the White Bay. Recently, 14 space advocacy groups issued a joint statement calling for the U.S. government to expedite the approval of SpaceX's Starship test flights. The statement highlighted some of the potential benefits Starship offers for both public and private sector space exploration and development, and urged the FAA and other federal agencies to grant SpaceX full approval to begin Starship orbital test flights as soon as possible. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.